Good morning. Thank you for joining us here today. We're happy to see everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Nichols and I'm the deacon for today. So I am filling in for um, Reverend Todd and for Denny, Pastor Denny. Um, so I think I'm gonna actually start with the announcements today. Um, Monday, we have a council meeting at seven o'clock. I think that is both churches. Um, on Wednesday, the Waste Not, Want Not meal will be from 3 to 5 right here. On Friday, we have a really exciting opportunity for you. The TGIF will be at the home of Roger Young, and he would like you to know that if you arrive early, you'll have the opportunity to get a ride in his Model A. So <laughs> something to look forward to. Um, and next week, um, Reverend Denny returns, and he will be preaching, and we will also have a coffee hour next week. So with that, I have one additional announcement. Uh, we have two verses for each of our hymns today. So if you'll join me, um, it's our church to start with three deep breaths to prepare for the morning. Good morning. I'm Bob Giles. I'm the visiting deacon today. Um, I'm going to suggest, having read what I'm going to do in the invitation, that you all stand because this really needs some energy. And we're going to have to see if we can make it so loud that people downtown hear us in the end. So here we go. Raise your voices in praise for your sins have been forgiven. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
again. Hallelujah. Shout it out. Stand straight and tall. Once you thought you were headed for the junkyard, and now you know you are God's treasure. Let us together rejoice, and for God is good. So let's hear it. Hip, 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 hooray. Hip, 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 hooray. Hip, 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 hooray. We'll now sing the first two verses of Rejoice and Pure. <laughs> being a Bible scholar, if somebody had asked me if Zephaniah was a book of the Bible, I'd have said, I don't think so, but we're reading from Zephaniah. So I, I did a little quick research. They think it was written at about 630 B.C. It's very short, uh, three verses, and it's the first two are a doom and gloom, and the last one is sort of a celebration and some hope. So we're going to read from 3, 14 to 17. As we hear the words of Scripture, Let us listen. from Zephaniah 3, 14 to 17, Sing aloud, O daughter Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you, he has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst, you shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of God shall stand forever. Lois Fletcher is going to lead us this morning. Lois? Good morning. Um, thank you for having me. I think I'm going to be a little... Here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, over the last seven or so years, I have been a part of Denny's uh, storytelling group and have shared some of the stories at the coffee houses. When Denny asked if I was um, interested in telling a faith story, in my notebook I wrote Faith Walk and made an outline of the life events in that walk. So when I met with Denny to go over my story, I asked if that is what he had in mind. Then he paused, being gracious and kind, <laughs> said, well, and so began our session. Ultimately, my story for you today is a snapshot of my faith walk. Initially, as a young, at a young age, faith simply meant going to church, and church was Roman Catholic. 
Both sets of my grandparents had immigrated from Sicily in the late 1800s and early 1900s. My grandparents spoke Sicilian, Italian, with my parents translating for them. Learning to speak Italian was never forced on us kids. It was actually frowned upon because that was the language from the old country. So I never learned to speak Sicilian, Italian. Until around 1963, the Catholic Mass was said in Latin, and it all sounded like Italian to me. As a result, I tuned it out. Yet once the Mass was spoken in English, I discovered something that I really liked. There was this one part during the blessing of the Eucharist, the communion, when the priest would recite, I leave you peace my peace I give you. I noticed that only the priest would say that. So thinking it was sinful for parishioners to recite it out loud, I would bow my head and underneath my breath I'd whisper the verse along with the priest. Even at the age of 10, there was something about that verse that transported me. It made me feel safe. However, I never equated it to God <clears throat> because in catechism, excuse me, <clears throat> there was an emphasis on the hierarchy of rules that gave me the impression that God was pretty unforgiving and rigid. As a result, in my mind, it appeared as if there was a gap between God and Jesus, like between Italian or Latin, and English. I heard it, but understood very little. Although, I was always curious about that feeling I had when I heard that verse. As the turbulent 1960s and 1970s challenged the norms of the day from our homes and our churches, to our schools, to civil rights, to feminism, to the wars of Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War, I rebelled. I went off to college and dropped out of any church going, except for holidays when I was home on a semester break. I eventually dropped out of college, moved out on my own, and worked at the Traveler's Insurance in Hartford. In 1977, I quit the Traveler's and returned to college with a more serious commitment and completed my undergraduate degree. But still, no serious thought or consideration about God or Jesus. They just resided in that Roman Catholic Church. In 1982, I married and moved to Germany where my husband was stationed for the military. It was scary. I didn't know anybody except Kenny. I didn't know the language and I needed to learn two new cultures. One, the German culture, and the other, the military culture. With a backdrop of the Cold War, terrorism was becoming more overt, like the Beirut bombings, forcing my husband to check around the tires and under the seat of his car every time we left for work. Feeling vulnerable, I wondered, what did I get myself into? It's not to say that we didn't travel and visit some wonderful sites in Europe, but there still was no movement to God or Jesus. After two years, in 1984, Kenny's tour ended when we returned home. One year later, I gave birth to our daughter, Erin. That was unexpected because when Kenny and I lived in Germany, I suffered a miscarriage. I was then told by my obstetrician that I would probably never have children, as the likelihood of even conceiving and then carrying a full pregnancy was highly unlikely. Aaron was a miracle. Between 1985 <clears throat> and 1986, when I was 32 and 33 years old, my marriage began to fall apart, ultimately placing me in a shelter for battered women, 
with a one-year-old child. Out of sheer desperation, I gravitated to Al-Anon and eventually surrendered my life over to the will of God. I was clearly lost and was wandering around in self-reliance with a short-sighted view of who God was. I was mostly drawn to step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with my higher power as I understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for me and the courage to carry it out. That was a tremendous shift. I came to understand that my faith had had blinders on because I had put God in a legalistic church box. And with step 11, I found myself planted at the beginning of building a relationship with Jesus. And that brought me to that same feeling I had as a youngster. When I heard Jesus' words, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. While Kenny and I were apart, he ended up in jail, admitted his alcoholism, attended program and family therapy with me and Aaron. After 10 months of separation, we reunited. It was not an easy road from there on, but our communication patterns changed and we moved back in together and began to invest in nurturing our marriage and family. On November 2nd of 1989, 10 years after my dad's death, I walked from where I worked at UConn's West Hartford campus to St. Joseph's College to attend a noon mass. After all, it was a All Souls Day, a holy day of obligation for Roman Catholics. During the mass, the priest gave a sermon on faith. In his summation, he said, you don't acquire your faith by participating in church, practicing the Ten Commandments, or reading the Bible. I kept thinking, where's he going with this? <laughs> Rather, he continued, you catch your faith in between doing all those things, really. So faith wasn't just organized religion in a church box, but faith in my regular life, another shift. In the early 2000s, I noticed a change, a reversal of sorts in mine and Kenny's communications. He was noticeably disengaged at the dinner table, finding fault too easily at the slightest thing. It was a telltale sign he was drinking again, and I fought the battle to maintain my serenity. In the summer of 2003, two weeks before our daughter Erin began her first semester away at college, Kenny told me he wanted a divorce. After 22 years of marriage, Kenny announced he wanted his independence that he didn't like, that he couldn't come and go as he pleased. Years later, I learned he was in another relationship and the two of them were drinking buddies. I was numb. I was heartbroken, albeit on shaken ground. I understood my love for my husband was unwavering. I just knew that I could not fight, <clears throat> excuse me, the disease. But I also worried about Erin. She was on the cusp of a pivotal undertaking, yet this new beginning for her was born of a rather messy ending. This was not how I had envisioned launching her on her path of independence for her future. In the quiet of one morning in 2004, I sat having my coffee in the kitchen contemplating the last stretch to sell the house and finalize the divorce. I asked God for a scripture verse so I could use it through what lay ahead. I opened my Bible, let the pages fall, and pointed 
my finger landed on Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God had poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Well, I didn't particularly like how it started, rejoicing and suffering, but I did like how it moved from the despair of suffering to the keep on keeping on of perseverance, to the soul substance of character, and to the light of hope. And then there appears that Holy Spirit, God and Jesus, the generation gap between the two of them was getting smaller and being filled with that Holy Spirit. I leave you peace, my peace I give you. It was during this tumultuous time that Erin found her relationship with Jesus. And during the summers of 2005 and 2006, she did mission work in the Dominican Republic. In 2007, I had an opportunity to go with her to the DR for a one-week mission trip. I had been skeptical because I didn't know if this was magical thinking on Aaron's part as a way to avoid processing the aftermath of the divorce or if this was God's plan. During that week in the DR, we attended service on that Sunday. The young pastor was originally from Chicago and he had gone on a mission trip to the DR where he met a young Dominican lady. They fell in love and married. They were adorable. He gave his sermon in English and she translated in Spanish. His sermon was on Romans 5, 3 through 5. I really don't remember a thing he said. I was too busy crying. It was overwhelming. God brought me to an island where he gave me the affirmation that he had my daughter in his hands and I could trust him. In a mighty way, God once again confirmed that faith was being actively woven into my regular life. As I continued on my Step 11 work, I found a book titled Praying the Names of God by Ann Spangler. This book gave an abbreviated list of 26 names for God. The names were given in Hebrew and English. And with each name, there was a week-long exercise of scriptures to read, commentary, questions to answer, and prayers to pray. At that time, I was a Connecticut State employee, and we were paid every two weeks. And that equals out to 26 pay periods. So I decided to extend the one week exercise into two weeks, whereby working through each name for each pay period, making it a long, year long engagement with God from paycheck to paycheck. I didn't begin with the first chapter. Rather, like what I did with the Bible, I opened up the book and just let the pages fall as they may. The first name that was given to me was El Kana, Jealous God, in that God cannot endure unfaithfulness. Because the walls of the box where I had put God were slowly fading away, I no longer saw God as the Hulk, big and angry. But he was persistent because he pursued me in order to turn me around, to see him in his faithfulness to me. And by standing faithful to step 11 and learning scripture, I happened upon Zephaniah 3, 17, our scripture verse for today. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 
And wouldn't you know, he did just that. One day, as I was preparing the house for sale by doing some painting, I was listening to some music. My husband was Jamaican, and I was missing the music he always listened to, so I decided to stream a Jamaican artist by the name of Barris Hammond. One song he sang was titled, Step Aside. One verse goes like this. No disrespect. Step aside now. Another man wants to take over because you don't know what you've got. So now it's time to lose her. Step aside. Wow. <laughs> Barris Hammond's words caught my attention. I stopped painting, and once again, I cried a cry of surrender. Faith is what you catch in between all things, but it's required me to be open and receive that which affirms the things of God in me. Because when I begin to feel lost, rejected, dismissed, invisible, unremarkable, he lets me stumble on verses like this. Isaiah 45, 3. I will give you hidden treasures stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name unknowingly at the age of 10 when the priest would recite I leave you peace my peace I give you the faith journey began with one step being that it's the 11th step but definitely not the 11th hour with another priest saying that faith is found outside of the box and in your life with Romans to the rescue, be it in my kitchen one early morning or in the DR with my only child, my daughter Erin, with a much more pale green giant with his singing and his hidden treasures. I rest in that peace that God gave me, that Jesus gave me in the pews of a church as a child whispering it back to him. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. That was wonderful. We appreciate that. Um, at this point in our service, we'd like to take some time and think about our joys and concerns. If anybody has anything to share. Yeah. The people of Afghanistan. Thank you. Yes. Prayers for the young, the family of the young firefighter in Barcelona. Any other thoughts we need to lift up? All right. God, as we sit here today in this beautiful place, please be with us. 
please share your loving care with the people of Afghanistan and the people of Haiti. God, thank you for the beauty of the sky that you shared with us during Lois's words. And God, please be with the family of the young firefighter in Bark Hampstead. Thank you also for the loving care for the families who are sending their students back to college. Loving Lord, thank you for the joy and peace that we have in trusting you. Now we lift our brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through difficult times or feeling alone or discouraged. Thank you for the constant call we hear from you every day. The wind whispering around our ears, the birds singing to us from the trees, rain pinging on the window, the good earth inviting our steps. We hear that call again and again through kind hands and warm hearts around us. Open our ears to your call, which is as expansive as the world and as particular as a poor man walking a dusty road to a cross on Calvary. Like him, help us to love, not just in word, but in deed. Love for our neighbors who are hard to love, love for newcomers in our community, love for people who are cast out by others. Forgive us for the times we have failed to share your love, choosing to hoard what is freely given. Fearful that we have limited resources, limited time, we're too tired. Thank you that even then, your consoling voice calls us. Help us to respond with cheerful hearts as we do your work. Strengthen those among us who face heavy burdens, who live with pain, physical, emotional, spiritual. Holy Spirit, bind us together as a community to sing your chorus of love faithfully and heartily. Multiply your call in us and through us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Right at this time, if you would be willing to stand, we have one more song. thousand ways to live in our commitment to this community as our benediction reminds us if you're able to make a donation there's a collection plate when you leave the parking lot if you are not your presence here is a gift in and of itself thank you for being a part of us today please join us in the benediction go forth into the world to serve God with gladness be of good courage hold fast to that which is good Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God. 
rejoicing through the power of the Holy Spirit. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.